manifestations of multimedia music, new conceptualism. With modernity came not only the binaural classical modernism, such as abstraction in painting, atonality in music or poems without semantics, not only meterless dance, collage, and new artistic media, such as photography, cinema, and electronic music, and of course much more, conceptual art also arrived, idea art. It started with Marcel Duchamp, who invented the ready-made in 1913. Any object can be placed on the pedestal, et voila, it is a work of art. It is no longer the essential effect that it is that is in the foreground, but the aesthetics of the idea, the thought behind it. He called it non-retina art. That was revolutionary, and Duchamp, having achieved that, basically stopped creating any more works of art. With the ready-made, he must have realized he had created something that generations to come would work and work on and continue to work with. Duchamp really did everything right, although his early paintings were also excellent, and it's almost a pity about that. But it took several decades, however, for the greatness, scope, and connectivity of the ready-made to be recognized at all. It was not until the 1960s, but at least Duchamp was able to experience it, that this practice was suddenly taken up by many artists in the visual arts, Andy Warhol's pop art, who transformed objects of mass culture into museum objects, the Fluxus generation, who, for example, staged little mind games with the text scores. This is an example from Yoko Ono. The performance art, which focused on a single idea in each work here, Marina Pramovic and Ulay. And finally, a label was also found for it, conceptual art or concept art, which anchored and established such. Artists like Saul Lewitt, Joseph Kossuth, and John Baldessari created works that primarily consisted of the formulation of an idea, which was then physically realized in various ways. For example, instead of painting, Lewitt wrote scores, so to speak, instructions on how to execute a painting. We know this in music, of course. And assistants of the gallery or the museum then put it into practice, always directly on the wall. That is, after the end of the exhibition, it is covered up again. Because what is at stake here is not the unique piece that the painter produces, but examples of the work of art, which can potentially have an infinite number of manifestations. Manifestations, here we are, also at the title of this lecture, this lecture series. Likewise, Joseph Kossuth, who is one and three chairs, consists of the concept of putting together a physical object, a photograph of it, and its verbal description. For example, a chair. So one as a concept and three variants then as an exhibit. But this is a different chair each time. So there is no original here. And then any other object of appropriate texture and size goes to. All these different variants point to the additional concept behind it. This practice was established in the visual arts in the 1960s and has been an integral part and highly popular since ever since. Stars of contemporary art such as Ai Weiwei, Santiago Serra or Damien Hirst are clearly counted as conceptual artists. If you go to Documenta, you see heaps of conceptual art. And in pop culture, concepts that can be implemented in infinite variations are now also established. The so-called memes, a funny idea that then appears in all possible variations, or people perform it. For example, the Harlem Shake, a bizarre, surprising dance act the first one guy has to dance with a helmet and then suddenly the rest joins him and you find loads of variations of this concept on the web. So I think that was popular in 2015. Yeah, and so it becomes then more and more uh, fancy and more and more bizarre and more and more meta and so on. <clears throat> or 
both subtitles uh, under a scene from the movie The Downfall, um, a concept with also with potentially infinite variations that can be implemented relatively easily by people all over the world, and which is eagerly done. But before I turn to the present, I have to go back into history again, because what about music? There, too, there were some conceptualist works early on. Even Duchamp had already devised a piece of music whose components were simply put together by pulling them loose from a head. John Cage then famously elevated the chance operation principle to his preferred method and mindset. Since the random throw of the dice is something completely different from Beethoven inventing a melody, we also have here a non-sensual part of the world, which is part of Cage's philosophy, and which must also be known in order to understand why there are in the scores of John Cage, so to speak, nonsensical collections of notes here, which are only meant to be themselves without any further intention. It is not without reason that Cage himself was so immensely active as a performer and lecturer throughout his life and exhibited scores. After all, all this was not at all self-evident. And then there is this most famous of all pieces of modern music, 4 minutes and 33 seconds, a piece that consists only of 4 minutes and 33 seconds of silence. The piece was published in 1952, at a time when conceptualism was not yet in vogue. And one has to put it into perspective. A conceptual reading of the piece only developed over time and then finally became common with the internet. From Cage's point of view, the idea of absence, silence, and non-performance was not the decisive factor in the composition in the first place but the intention to elevate all the other noises of the concert hall, the ventilation system, the rustling of the audience, etc., to a piece of music. So to show there is no such thing as absolute silence, we always hear something, even if it is our own blood and nerves. And that is what Cage declared, 4 minutes and 33 seconds, to be an auditory experience, a piece of music. Cage himself originally wrote the piece as a piano piece, which is, of course, almost absurd because what is the point of an instrumental specification if no instrumental sound is to be played at all? In fact, Cage left it free to play the piano piece with any instrument, and so there is also orchestras playing it. For example, recently the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra played it as a comment on the corona measures. But it was only with the internet that the piece became a meme, a piece of pop culture, where it was now interpreted in every conceivable way. And now here it becomes yet another aesthetic experience. You can't listen to all that anymore, nor should you. They are all now copies of the idea, and as such, they have an effect. The fact that the internet strongly promotes the conceptualist reading is a thesis I will put forward more often today. And from the free instrumentation of the piece to its existence as thousands and thousands of videos on YouTube, we see that the piece has become a piece of multimedia art. Other examples from the history of music. Since the 1960s, there have been isolated pieces that at least came into the world from a central idea, albeit with a more sensual intention than the radical conceptual works of visual art. One could mention Steve Reich's Pendulum Music, which consists of the instruction to let several microphones swing over loudspeakers, always producing a feedback sound in the vicinity of the loudspeakers. The composer has given almost all the details out of hand here. There is no score. The pitches are always different depending on the setup. After the initial deflection, gravity alone does its job. 
musically interesting are the patterns that result from the superimposition of periodic processes plus a constant decrease of energy. The principle is then feasible in many different variants. In the meantime, there is also the version by FX Twin with disco balls and lasers, or the piece for 100 metronomes by Ligetin, in which similarly the superimposition of many different tempo with gradual slackening of the spring of each metronome produces manifold degrees of density and complex patterns. Incidentally, there is now also a conceptualist take up of this principle where the idea is still present. Niklas Seidel and Paul Hübner have created a digital version of it where instead of the respective spring force of the mechanical metronome, they simply collected YouTube videos of metronomes, which all last for different lengths and all have their own tempo. And with split screen representation, we then also experience this gradual reduction. Or myself, I brought together different reading tempos that manifest themselves acoustically with the sound, the tape turning. Or Alvin Lucio has taken anti virtuosity to the extreme with music for a solo performer. The soloist is given electrodes that measures the brain waves, and only if the brain remains in a state of rest, that is, if possible, nothing is done, nothing is thought, the brain frequencies that are then created are passed on to prepared loudspeakers and thus make sound. The difficult task that the soloist has is to do as little as possible. Difficult task. Unlike Ligeti, all right, it is clear that here the tonal result is really not of musical interest in the traditional sense. Nothing special happens except that more or less sound is created. What is interesting here is the performative concept that we are witnessing an attempt by the soloist to do as little as possible, unlike usual on stage. And only then we do get something. The preparations for the loudspeakers are arbitrary. To just sound something. It is not without reason that the application of the equipment itself is celebrated in such detail as we have seen before. They are not only a technical prerequisite for the player, but also an aesthetic prerequisite for the audience's hearing. Another example from history would be Stockhausen's text pieces Aus den Sieben Tagen, from the Seven Days, which read, for example, play a sound with the certainty that you have an infinite amount of time and space. Or it, think nothing. Wait until it is absolutely still within you. When you have attained this, begin to play. As soon as you start to think, stop and try to reattain the state of non-thinking. Then continue playing. This, of course, has a parallel with Lucier, only this time not really technically attempted, but now as a wholly mental, or one could even say a spiritual performance. There are recordings of these pieces, but first of all, in my opinion, knowledge of the concept of this text is essential here too, for the players anyway, this is the score for them, but I think the following also applies to the listener. Listen to the sound with a certainty that you have an infinite amount of time and space. And I would like to say, it perhaps again is the subsequent, even more conceptual reading. For me, after hearing the recording of Stockhausen's own musicians, for example, I actually prefer reading these pieces, understanding them as a mind game, as a musical idea alone in my head, similar to Yoko Ono's text pieces. This brings me to a circumstance that jumps to my mind here anyway. When I earlier praised 
Solowitz Corps for paintings as an art historical innovation. As a musician, one must immediately think, well, yes, we've had that for a good thousand years. And it was on this level that in the time of the emerging conceptualism, that is in the 1960s, was recognized what was slumbering here. The notation of music is already a remarkable medial transformation of the sound into another medium, into the graphic, the textual, and the quantitative, and thus also into the mind, with precursors back to the Renaissance. This dimension of music was also developed. Pieces like this are no longer playable at all. They are themselves aesthetic objects, or they refer to an imaginary music. I too have been active in this genre, one could say. And then these pieces can be hung on walls in gallery spaces uh, to be museum music at the wall. And this brings us to the heart of the matter. Music itself, as Manas Sangaris so beautifully puts it, is the oldest multimedia art. We have just seen that music is not only sound, but also a graphic and textual practice in the form of notes. Text is also almost always present in music as the title of a piece or a text is sung. Then the rendition of music is also a performative or even theatrical affair. After all, we don't close our eyes at a concert. We also like to look at how music is being played. Then the instruments are also objects and almost sculptural quality is inherent in them whose aesthetics the artists take up in 2D and 3D. Then sound as a spatial arrangement is, uh, can also be an exhibition piece, the sound art. Rhythms can be articulated not only with sound, but also with light and video. And there are abstracted ideas of sound, of music, of the listening concept that are actually always there in music and which have now also become more and more of interest and relevance for composition. Here you can already see, if anything falls apart like this into the multimedia, what actually holds the thing together at all? It is the idea, the concept that can still define a work at all, which is of course very dialectical because as has already been shown, it is characteristic and constitutional for a concept that it can manifest itself in many different variants, indeed in different media forms of existence. Conceptual art is actually multimedia by definition because there is a concept and then the possibility of manifold physical versions. So the genre of music is also up for discussion. Perhaps everything will now become media art, but more about that later. Going further in history and with a focus on music, compared to the triumphant advance of conceptual art in the visual arts, conceptual works in music have remained rare. But before I explain this in more detail, I need to clarify what I am talking about. I will now give a short definition of conceptual music based on definitions Solo Witt gave of conceptual art. This clarification is necessary because again and again, in the meantime, people claim things as conceptual music that, in my opinion, is not. There is always conceptual thinking somewhere and somehow in the music, but a veritable conceptual music is still something of its own. Lewitt published paragraphs on conceptual art and sentences on concept art in 1967 and 69, respectively, from which I quote, the idea becomes a machine that makes the art. So it's the idea that generates everything else. Ligeti's metronome piece fits this very well. Imagine Ligeti letting the metronomes run, but then starting to stop a metronome here and there, restarting it, changing its tempo, etc. In other words, composing details. It would be the destruction of the powerful, independently running machine. 
the independent force that was set in motion here. Of course, an interesting piece of music could be generated or cre created in this way, but it would no longer be a concept piece. That is to say, if the composer decides whether the next tone should be C or C sharp, then it is not concept music because the concept would have to make that decision. Continuing the wit, for each work of art that becomes physical, there are many variants that do not. So here, the reference to the ideal core of a work, even if, or precisely because there are many possible variants, the actual work is the idea behind it. When an artist learns his craft too well, he makes slick art. Just like too many expressive interventions in the conceptual machine, too much good craft also spoils the conceptual character, because then the sensual appearance dominates over the ideal core again. Yeah, this is where music is very lacking, one could say. I can see several reasons why conceptual art did not have a particularly wide resonance in music at first, unlike the visual arts since the 1960s. First, music takes place in time. It is renditioned. As a listener, you are trapped in your chair in the concert. You cannot, as in the exhibition, determine for yourself the time you give to a work. But since conceptual art is not so much about the sensual aspect, the unique manifestation, but about a transcendent idea, a defined duration for which one has to expose oneself to the thing is not so adequate. Second, music, despite all modernity, has retained a tradition of sensuality, expressivity, and emotionality, which stands in the way of conceptual understanding. Since the Viennese school, the connection to tradition has been assiduously emphasized. While the visual arts at the beginning of the 20th century not only abandoned representationalism and central perspective, but Marcel Duchamp was able to take the radical step of the ready-made as early as 1913, and Kazimir Malevich hung his super-minimalistic Black Square in 1915, in music alone, the atonality was so much of the shock that its inventor, Arnold Schoenberg, apologetically again swore the loyalty to the conservative forerunner, Johannes Brahms. A birth defect of new music, this incomplete cutting of the chord, which the visual arts did not commit. Third, Music, for all its modernity, has a technical quality requirement in terms of performance, in terms of high standard instruments, in terms of the acoustic quality of the hall, also in terms of the completeness of a concert. A concert has to last at least an hour or up to two or three, which gets in the way of conceptual perception. Art like that of Joseph Kosuth, Damien Hirst, or Marina Abramovich, would not be suitable here. And fourth, for a long time, music has remained very much to itself in terms of media. It is composed sound, organized and performed in time, unlike the immensely expansive visual arts having become multimedia much earlier. The step into atonality was so daring that few further steps followed. Thus, the possibility of further media that could insert the conceptual background was hardly given. That was true until the beginning of the 2000s. If I quickly and very roughly describe a few major currents in new music between 1970 and 2000, I could mention the neue Einfachheit, the new simplicity of which Wolfgang Riem is the main protagonist, the Musique Concrète Instrumentale Helmut Lachenmann invented and followed, for example, by Matthias Sparling or Salvatore Sciarino. The new complexity uh, Brian Fernie founded, the spectralist school after Grise, 
et cetera, PP, there are still many more missing here, but what was really almost non-existent is conceptual music. Anyway, I would say between 1970 and 2000, it was a phase of restoration after the avant-garde decades. Conceptual music wasn't completely non-existent. I mentioned a few examples like Ligeti, Reich, or Lucier, but I would like to think that it remained quite marginal compared to the other currents I just mentioned. The term concept music did not exist in the 20th century. Even in Ligeti's own oeuvre, the metronome piece remained singular. But then something decisive happened, a media revolution. Digitization and the internet came along. The possibilities of digital sound processing, of digital art. Suddenly there was software where cutting a sound file is practically the same operation as cutting a video. All of a sudden there was a stage that has much more the character of an exhibition, the platforms of the internet. All of a sudden everyone has a video camera. Suddenly, it has become much easier and more common to use all kinds of technical devices, such as video projection, in a music concert. And the artists make use of it, of course. And suddenly, there is also a new way of listening, a new reception. I already briefly pointed out with the memes how the internet has fueled a new culture of its own. And so it has now also helped conceptual music to gain a new presence and also conceptual writing and conceptual theater, by the way. Examples. Eric Carlson has collected a large number of recordings of the opening chords of the Eroica and compiled them chronologically. The result is not only an interesting and amusing historical walk through recording qualities, orchestral tunings and interpretation history, but also a kind of minimal music, an idiosyncratic rhythm and temporal melody on E-flat major.
as concepts go, they can be reapplied in many different ways. So the concept has been applied to, for example, the iconic chord in Stravinsky, Sacre de Planton. To the bassoon solo at the very beginning of the piece. To all the babies in British beer song. To all yes and little songs. To all the sirens, the flashes, and the bark of the Another nice concept of Carson's is to arrange Schubert's Winterreise alphabetically. That is all words with an A in a row, then all with B, etc. The Eroica piece is hardly conceivable without the internet. It made use of its archives and is not a concept piece itself, but a typical, not too long internet video. Anyway, a typical form has become this list style or as, it's, as it is called in internet pop culture, compilations or supercuts. Here is an example of mine. Die funktionale Ausdifferenzierung der Gesellschaft. Das hier ist Black Doom Metal. Black Metal. Dark Metal. Death Doom Metal Death Metal Doom Metal Doom Core Metal the concept of orchestrating voice recordings for piano, that is, digitizing them, so to speak, transferring them into the pitch system of the equal tempered tuning of the 88 piano keys, and thus musicalizing them to such a degree that it oscillates fascinatingly between speech and music, Peter Applinger has implemented this concept in many variations, such as in the 100 part voices and piano cycle, or here with a player piano. An internet hit viewed over a million times. Concatenative synthesis is the term for arranging many small samples to create a completely different result. Media artist Cory Archangel has reinterpreted Arnold Schoenberg's piano pieces, Opus 11, music of early atonality, flickering expressionism, with snippets from YouTube videos of cats pawing over piano keys. A wonderfully ironic work about the cliche of atonal music as Katzen music, cat music, and the internet as big data, total archive, and what Jean-Francois Lyotard calls the Postmodernization of modernity. Other examples of the same concept are the synthesis of Yeah, and someone even remounted Buff's Budinary from Mounts from porn films. <laughs> and only a new to this here audio. <laughs> yeah, the step into pop culture is the short one. Anton Vasiliev has programmed the computer to read the text of Karl Marx's Kapital, and the key terms, capital and labor, 
are filtered out and sounded differently, of course, put to left and right channel, thus making the frequency and dialectical relationship of labor and capital aesthetically experiential. Again, a concept that can be implemented in many ways. Vasiliev himself also applied it to keywords from the Russian national anthem, or I made a version in which the subject-object problem was sonically extracted from Arthur Schopenhauer's Die Welt als Wille und Vorstellung. Here are many different variations on a concept, namely the sonification of stock prices, again arranged into a formally cohesive piece. 2009 was the climax of the so-called financial crisis at the time, and stock prices had all been going steeply down for months. At the same time, Microsoft launched a children's composition software called SongSmith. I transcribed the share prices into melodies and fed them into this children's composition software, which makes a happy sound out of every input. And then I applied that with all kinds of stock charts and then also on data from the Iraq war and others. Three things become particularly clear from this example. First, as in the previous ones, algorithmic processing plays a leading role. The machine that produces the conceptual piece is now primarily the algorithm. Another example would be the composer Dylan Richard, for he is specifically concerned with the recommendation algorithms of music on YouTube and Spotify. Second, Multimediaization, anyway. The piece Charts Music was unfortunately also played over and over again on the radio, even though I specifically forbade it. You can't play it on the radio, it doesn't work. Of course, you absolutely have to see the video for it, the derivation of the melodies from the share prices. Only then it does work aesthetically. And with all the other pieces just shown, Arplinger only works if there are subtitles, otherwise you don't understand the word. You have to know the background concept of Archangel and Vasiliev. With Carlson, the interpretation credits are at least a nice addition. So, for this semantic additional information, an additional medium is also needed. Video is, of course, a good choice here, but in a concert, it could also be a performance, a handout, etc. And third, politicization. Conceptualization is followed by contextualization. We have also seen it with Vasiliev. Arplinger also repeatedly includes political aspects. And in some of my works, this plays an essential role, as you have just seen in Chart's music.
or <clears throat> or in my piece, Fremdarbeit, Foreign Labor, I received a commission for a new piece from the festival Klangwerkstatt Berlin. And I then delegated this commission to a Chinese composer and an Indian programmer who were to produce stylistic copies of my own music. Now for this composition commission. There are then two aspects to this. The question of authorship, who composed this music in? And the question of the value of music, that is, politically, it's about exploitation, because these assistants from China and India were much cheaper than the price I got for the commission. So the production of the music was relocated to low-wage countries, just as it happens with mobile phones, with clothes, etc. Here, for example, at a performance of a piece, there is the role of the moderator, usually myself, who tells the conceptual and political background of the piece. You can't just play the music here. But I want to bring another piece of mine a little closer here, my piece or the action product placement. For years, I worked a lot with sampling and collage in my music. And it became clear to me that it is not unproblematic in, uh, from a legal point of view copyright, and that GEMA in Germany records this kind of thing like this at the time, 2008. There is a registration form for a new work, and there you are also supposed to indicate whether the work contains foreign parts. Hmm, what is a foreign element in music? When I compose a piano piece, I use something I didn't invent, the piano. There is a bit of space on the form, as you can see here, it's two lines where one can write that, for example, you have written a cover version. But in the internet age, completely different technical and thus aesthetic dimensions are uh, possible. It is the nowadays mashup culture happening. I took this to the extreme. I composed a short, 33 second long piece of music so it's an electronic piece that contains 70,200 samples, foreign samples. This is the piece. It took me about a day to compose the piece. I didn't edit it by hand, of course. I created it algorithmically. Whereas it took six weeks to then print out the necessary 70,200 forms that were required to register that piece. Because in the footnotes of the form, it says, original title of folk tune or other works use must be listed here. The still widely believed notion that eight or four bars may be used without permission is incorrect. And then I registered a short piece of music with GEMA, as it were, as a piece of musical theater in the public domain. Am 12. September 2008 ist es soweit. Kreidler fährt mit einem Lastwagen voller Papier bei der GEMA Generaldirektion in Berlin am Wittenbergplatz vor. Etwa 50 Personen erwarten ihn vor dem Gebäude. Journalisten von Zeitungen und Blogs, Radio und Fernsehen, Musiker, Creative Commons Aktivisten und Politiker der Grünen sowie der Piratenpartei. Musik ist keine Kunst mehr. Musik ist eine juristische Fachdisziplin. Aber ich mache aus dem Juristischen wieder Kunst. Das ist ein Musiktheaterstück. Das ist der erste Akt. Sie erleben die Aufführung einer von 500.000 Werkanmeldungen, die jährlich bei der GEMA eingehen. Wird dieses Stück legal sein oder illegal? Wird es vielleicht das illegalste Musikstück der Musikgeschichte sein? 
Darauf dürfen wir jetzt gespannt sein. Es muss natürlich im digitalen Zeitalter eine neue Möglichkeit gefunden werden für die Verbreitung einerseits und für die Vergütung andererseits. Ich begrüße sich von der GEMA. Ich bin selbst Mitglied von der GEMA, das möchte ich sehr betonen. Ich wünsche mir sehr als Partner der GEMA, dass wir in diesen Zeiten Möglichkeiten finden, dass Künstler ihre Kunst verbreiten können, dass sie dafür vergütet werden. Und ich hoffe, wir kommen dann ins Gespräch. Es ist Herbst und ich möchte einen schönen Pflaumenkuchen backen. Wenn ich aber bei Nacht und Nebel in den Garten steige und die Pflaumen einfach wegnehme, oder wenn ich, und das scheint mir so ein bisschen die Zielrichtung zu sagen, das ist ein nicht geistiges Eigentum, das ist materielles Eigentum. Ähm, äh, geistiges Eigentum ist wie materielles Eigentum. Es geht auch nicht um Pflaumen, sondern um einen Pflaumenkuchenrezept. Es geht um den konkreten Pflaumenkuchen. Die Pflaumen müssen kopiert werden. Pflaumen für alle. Ich möchte es sehen, der Pflaumen kopiert. Besides the, again, political orientation of this work, we also see very well here, there is at its core a very short piece of music. Then there is a sculpture, the forms. There was the action, there was already a video piece with its announcement. I also wrote an essay on the whole thing. The magazine Positionen had brought out a whole thematic issue for the occasion. And ultimately, all the discussions around it are also part and aspect of the work. So it's a very multimedia work. And all of this is based on the concept of over-affirmation, or to put it another way, subversive affirmation, to highlight the bureaucratic dilemma of copyright in the digital times in music. A nice example of how I understand multimedia art in contrast to such a paltry understanding of somehow colorful moving graphics like a screensaver. So me also Georg Kaidu's description of an opera, The Leap, Beschreibung einer Oper, Der Sprung, which is much more than a stage work or actually generally something other than that. On the website for it, there are also documents on the creation, recordings of conversations, scientific articles, software, graphics, etc which are also available, and all of that is the work. A very recent example is the project Crypto Silence by Dmitry Kulyansky, who offers silence for sale as a sound file in various formats as a non-fungible token, NFT. Essentially a sound file, a piece of music, if you will, but with a very specific idea that unfolds its effect in the economic space or as a concept because there's actually nothing to hear here. Similarly, Patrick Frank has declared a short piano song to be progressively more expensive object for sale and thus conceptualized an increasing aesthetic quality. Text scores are another project of media transformation. I mentioned them briefly earlier as a typical medium of the Fluxus artists. After the Fluxus period in the, 90, in the early 1960s, however, these little cards almost completely disappeared again from aesthetic practice until the new conceptualism emerged. For again, it is the internet that gives the multimedia constitution of conceptual music a stage again at all. And for the last 10 years, there has been a predestined medium for the text score, Twitter. What used to be the small card with limited space is now Twitter with its limit of first 140, now 280 characters. And so, for example, for a year, there was a project Text Score a Day by several composers who published a concept piece here every day. Or Jennifer Walsh started a Twitter account presenting algorithmically created text scores via Markov chains. Or also I have published one and the other work on Twitter and Facebook. To add the installative here, 
of striking topicality is Michaelis Bangueros ad libitum. He has connected medical ventilators to organ pipes. How this work from 2016 has gained in significance in conceptual surplus since spring 2020, and especially in Italy, I don't need to explain to anyone here. In this example, as in Lucius' solo performer, you can see that a very specific instrument, a special setup, was built, and this is the piece of music. This embodies the concept. Again, the idea is a machine. This can be an algorithm or, as here, really a machine, a respirator. Another example of a conceptual sound installation, in contrast to the classic sound art being more defined as sound is distributed in space rather than in time, is Jens Brandt's Chi player. He took geographic altitude data from Google Earth and read it out as sound waves. So imagine the whole earth is a vinyl record and the player with the needle moves along all mountains and valleys and hence plays its sound. Yeah, the earth is a disc. All these works, whether they take place primarily on the internet or not, are unthinkable without digitization be it in the need for the technology, be it in their form of presentation, be it in their documentary transmission, be it in their dramaturgical form. And the character of art perception on the internet, which is more like that of an exhibition than a concert, has an effect on the establishment of innovative formats outside the net. For example, exhibition forms for concept music. In 2012, two exhibitions caused a sensation. Sound, yeah. sound art at the ZKM in Karlsruhe and a house full of music at the Mathildenhöhe Darmstadt. The latter was celebrated in all the major feuilletons and received the renowned Justus Beer Prize for curators. In Darmstadt in particular, the success was due to ingenious technical solution of how to exhibit music, in this case with a headphone system activated by Bluetooth in the respective radius of a work. Today's technology makes it possible, and there is more and more music for which such a form of presentation is more suitable than the concert hall. But it was also clear that the curators had decided to expose only short pieces, none lasted longer than 10 minutes, so that it was still possible to walk through the whole exhibition in one afternoon. Short works, but many of them together, a kind of salon hanging. Be that as it may, the result was great, and it set a precedent. In 2013, for example, there was the first exhibition of sound art at the Museum of Modern Art in New York with soundings. Durational formats, that is concert installations, are also becoming more and more common. I am thinking of Patrick Frank's theory opera at the Donau Eschinger Musiktag 2015, which took an entire day. The conceptualization of all the arts is also boosted by digitalization because computers are becoming more and more powerful. Today, everyone has Warhol's factory and the Cologne studio at home with the power of a normal laptop, which makes it all the more necessary to achieve what computers cannot achieve, at least not yet, originality. At the same time, some theory on the subject was developed. 2009 saw the publication of In the Blink of an Ear, towards a non-cochlear sonic art by Seth Kim Cohen. Non-cochlear, of course, refers to Duchamp's non-retinal art, sound art that does not address the ear, the cochlea, but more directly, the mind. In 2012, Harry Lehmann's The Digital Revolution of Music was published, and in it there is the chapter Conceptual Music. Lehmann explicitly focuses here on the conceptualization of music as a consequence 
of digitalization. In 2013, Peter Osborne, in his book, Anywhere or Not at All, Philosophy of Contemporary Art, Osborne noted the post-conceptual status of art today, an unfortunate choice of words, in my opinion, similar to post-internet, as if we were living in a after the internet or after conceptual art time, which is not what is meant at all. But post here means since the internet, since the conceptual term. Anyway, Osborne says, the medium-specific modernism of a plurality of arts is essentially a 19th century tradition. In other words, everything becomes conceptual media art that sometimes uses this medium, sometimes that medium. And I wrote the book, Sentences on Musical Concept Art. And from this book, I will now present the title giving manifesto. Earlier, I gave a short definition of conceptual music, now comes a comprehensive one. The sentences on musical concept art, of course, refer to Solowitz's sentences on concept art. So here they are with some comments. A concept piece is entirely determined by one transient idea. The idea is a machine that produces the work of art. The process should have required no intervention. It should take its own course. Lewitt, 1967. The concept machine today is above all the algorithm. The processing material of the machine today is the total archive, so the internet. Details, rhetorical means, and formal design are usually only suitable in the form of ready-mades or by means of chance generators. For each work of art that is performed physically, there are many unperformed variants. Levit 1967. So there is no unique work. The essential appearance is only one aspect of the work to which more or less value can be granted. Each piece of new music has conceptual aspects, as my teacher Matthias Spalinger says in 2009. Not all ideas have to be implemented. Again, Lewitt, 67. On the other hand, one can also compose a detailed form out of many different concept variants or pieces. Enrichment with jokes is also okay. So that was uh, the attempt in the piece Charles music. A banal idea cannot be rescued by a beautiful and expressive design. However, it is difficult to bungle a good idea. Lewitt, 67. A good idea can be bungled through a beautiful and expressive design. Ideas are the most expressive and most beautiful of all. For example, we all appreciate the creativity and originality that children produce uh, with language, for example. Improvisation is rarely musical concept art, least of all when the improvisation is good. Because again, the improviser constantly decides whether the next tone should be C or C sharp, but the concept should do that decision. Musical conceptualism can be considered as a minimalism. An idea is the smallest possible whole, das kleinste mögliche Ganze, as Robert Musil says. So it is, so to speak, also a, a solution for the form problem, since an idea cannot be divided into two halves. An idea is a whole, and it is, as Musil says, the smallest possible whole. Music does not have to be self-explanatory. The composer does not need to shy away from intermediate ingredients like text, video, performance. Indeed, it makes perfect sense to articulate them. Do not hide important information in the program notes. So make it really a multimedia piece. Dare to make public or publish the even slightest idea, if you believe there is something in it. But give it a proportionate effort, no more than a small text for a small idea. Therefore, Twitter is very appropriate. A piece of conceptual music does not have to be completely heard. That is why an exhibition space is often more appropriate. Music is only new music when it raises the question, is this actually music? Matthias Spalinger, 92. Spalinger here mainly refers to atonality, questioning whether this is at all music, but now would extend this to the question when 
music is multimedia, then also the question is, is this actually music? Yeah, but then it is new music. And only then it is new music when this question arises. The more unmusical, the better, which does not mean it has to be as ugly as possible. I rather would say it is about creating something which is not yet music. Out of conceptualization emerges contextualization, Peter Weibel, 1903. That's why many conceptual works are actually, for, or for example, have a political um, concept or a political content. And no concept without conceptualism. Just as many examples refer to the concept behind it, all concept pieces refer to conceptualism as an art practice and art philosophy. It's already hard to go back to 10 years ago when this was still quite controversial. I think no one will deny that conceptual music has increased significantly in the last decade. It was so distinctive precisely because, dialectically speaking, music had until then been such a non-conceptual medium. Until then, music was still comparable to oil painting in terms of media. And just look how marginal painting in oil has become in the fine arts. In conclusion, I come back to what I said relatively early on today and again ties in with the aforementioned Peter Osborne. If music, which is already composed in a very multimedia way, is increasingly amplified in this, conceptual background on the one hand and multimedia realization on the other. Where does the music lie at all? Are the works shown here still music at all? Or does it not matter what you call it? Like John Cage said, if it's not music to you, then call it something else. Well, I don't think it doesn't matter, at least not as long as there are still music academies, as long as there are specialist journals such as Musiktexte, Neue Zeitschrift für Musik, etc., as long as the scene in which such things take place is called New Music. And its festivals are called Donaueschinger Musiktage, Darmstädter Ferienkurse für Neue Musik, etc. That's not something that can be renamed easily. Sorry, Mr. Cage. Conceptual thinking in the arts has posed and continues to pose exciting challenges. It almost seems like this, just as we still say, oh, there is it, yeah. just as it seems, we still, we still say telephone to the universal pocket computer for historical reasons. We still say music to some actually multimedia pieces and media artworks or performative actions. But it seems like this. 100 years ago, music was dissolved as a tonal concept. Now it is dissolved as a media concept. Music was no longer bound to the tonal center of a key. Now music is no longer bound to the medial center of sound. It can be performance, video, graphic, installation, film, website, action, concert. It's similar with the definition of a musical instrument, which is being strained a lot today. Is a laptop a musical instrument? Is a circuit of controllers still categorically comparable to the unity and identity of a musical instrument like the oboe? And the players, are they still instrumentalists or, however, performers? The definition of music and its associated terms are under some definitional stress. But I can make some offers here. It is not without reason that the degree program here in Hamburg is called multimedia composition, not multimedia music. Harry Lehmann speaks of relational music to which an extra musical relation, a semantic information, for example, as a video, is added. You could speak of an extended definition of music, ein erweiterter Musikbegriff, in reference to Josef Beuys' expanded concept of art, the, the erweiterten, Mus the erweiterten Kunstbegriff. Or a dissolved definition of music, uh, ein aufgelöster Musikbegriff, 
which still refers to music because it dissolves it. Then, however, the step is not far to simply call it media art. Nina Neske, I salute her, has also made a beautiful suggestion that one could speak of the aufgehobener Musikbegriff. Uh, this cannot be translated because it's this Hegelian dialectical double meaning of unruled and, as it were, preserved. We could also speak of music in these works where a conceptual listening prevails, a listening that essentially also functions as an active knowledge of concepts that lie behind sound. This listening has in turn become much more relevant through postmodernism and, for example, through the hashtagging on the internet. The tendency of musical material of which Adorno spoke is that of conceptualization. Or one could say that media art that addresses the field of listening, sound, or the culture of music in a particularly quantitative and or qualitative form, referring here to a specific expertise and tradition where music is used as a medium of media art, that would be media art with music, and that can be attributed to the realm of music. Again, the concept refers to music. Thank you very much for your attention.